Diamonds shine not only in our rings, but also in our lives, representing lasting love, strength, and beauty. Drew found amazing antiques at incredibly low prices from Robin, who does house clearances. First, Drew bought a lovely chair for only £15. Wonderful, untouched things for no money. And it's lovely, but imagine the guy that made that in a barn somewhere by candlelight, by hand. You know, that's 200 years ago. Saying it was better than a previous £25 purchase, he then found another 18th century chair for the same price and couldn't believe his luck. Next, he spotted a charming 19th century chair, also for £15, and was thrilled. Drew loved these old untouched chairs and admired their 200-year-old craftsmanship. He also found a beautiful wall hanging with mirrors for £150, predicting it would double in value. Drew then discovered an octagonal sandstone planter, which he bought for £50, realising it was worth much more. Just quickly open it up. Drew's playful purchase of a gnome doorstop for £10 added humour to his finds. Lastly, he unearthed a large country house rug for £80 with hardly any fading. Drew was ecstatic with his haul, which included three 18th century chairs, a beautiful rug, a pot and a wall hanging. Robin's low prices made Drew very happy. Drew thought these bargains were fantastic. Robin's pricing ensured satisfied customers. Drew felt triumphant. He loved getting such wonderful items at great prices. Drew expands his antique business, turning unique finds into treasures. Sam and Kate have joined the shop, with Sam assisting in setting it up. The shop reflects Drew's cool and unique vision. Drew focuses on weekend sales, while Sam and Kate manage online sales during the week. With the new shop, Drew aims to double his turnover by buying quality items in large quantities at reasonable prices. Malvern, located between Herefordshire and Worcestershire, hosts a major antique market. He continues to explore, knowing sellers will bring out more stock. Despite many stallholders leaving early, Drew finds a German dealer and buys several West German items. Drew and his colleague T travel to Welshpool, Powys, to visit F.E. Anderson Antiques, run by Ian Anderson. Drew finds a pair of early 20th century tapestry wall hangings for £500. I'll tell you what I want from 500 quid for the pair, but they're oh, beautiful. Let's get them out and have a look. Drew visits an antique warehouse in Eversham and buys a quirky first aid cabinet for £350. Tell you what, can we then. just go to 350 and have it done? 350 for the cabinet and a tenner for the key. His strategy of buying quality items in quantity proves successful. Smaller pieces like the pots from Malvern quickly attract buyers once displayed. A local couple purchases some of the pots. Drew's careful selection ensures his shop remains high quality. His approach maintains high standards and keeps the shop's inventory fresh and appealing. Drew and T find hidden treasures in a sign shop on the south coast. Drew and T drive over five hours to Portsmouth. They visit Aberhurt Signs LTD, a well-known sign writing business. Owner John Aberhart is the second generation to work at the business, which was started by his father in 1956. John wants to find good homes for the remaining signs made by his family. Drew and T are excited to explore the old factory. They look for treasures like old letters, neon signs and pub signs, and they find a ladies' cloakroom sign from a theatre. I think about £80. Pounds. Drew plans to do minor fixes to the sign, making it a great addition to his collection. Next, they find a set of bronze and enamel letters from the 1920s and 30s, which are popular for decorating. Doing a bulk purchase at £400. Pounds. Then, Drew spots German binoculars and a tripod from the 1940s. He negotiates with John and buys them for £1,400. Pounds. Drew is very happy with this find, considering it is one of his best discoveries. Even though they came for neon signs, Drew leaves pleased with what they bought. John is glad his items will be enjoyed in new places. Overall, the day is a success. Discover the hidden gems at DMK in Warrington, where salvaged glassware meets decorative potential. DMK in Warrington salvages and supplies heat-resistant glassware for labs. Founded in 2003, the firm's owners are Kerry Mayer and David Mason. Despite high costs, they believe Drew will find items of interest. Drew arrives at DMK and is warmly welcomed. He is immediately struck by the variety of glassware, especially a rotary evaporator. The staff explains this device in detail. Drew is fascinated by DMK's reuse and recycling efforts, which remind him of his own beginnings in the industry. 
Drew examines the glass options, considering their potential as decorative antiques, he is captivated by the larger sculptural pieces. He negotiates for a deal for several items, including large borosilicate glass reducers. Vessels could be worth around £1,000. Drew buys a chipped glass piece for £150, discounted due to its imperfection. Despite the chip, he sees its decorative potential. He continues exploring DMK's storage yard, finding more items and negotiating prices. Drew is impressed by the sculptural qualities of DMK's glassware. He appreciates their salvaging efforts, and he believes these items will appeal to the decorative antiques market. At a Derby auction, Drew Pritchard hunts for rare items for profit. Drew Pritchard was at an auction house in Derby, where he picked items he hoped would be profitable. He was excited about his finds and was bidding against an online rival for a mahogany George III lowboy. Drew won the table for £130. At 130 against my absentee bid. 130. But he knew there would be extra costs like VAT and the buyer's premium. He also thought about the costs for restoration, photography, and shipping. With more items still available, he continued looking around and found an oak table base from around 1700 to 1720 that needed a new top. Drew won it for 160 pounds, knowing he would spend another three to 400 pounds to fix it. 160. Thank you, and that's 1475. Drew's main goal was a unique barrel-backed armchair from the early Victorian era. The chair had special features like scrolled armrests, barley twist supports, and a single back leg. It was worth about 1700 pounds. Drew was ready to bid up to 1200 pounds, including the extra 25% buyer's premium. He won the chair for 280 pounds and planned to sell it for a couple of thousand pounds after reupholstering it. At 280 in the room. 280. And that is 1475. Thank you. Drew was happy with his buys and felt good about their potential. Back at the workshop, he wanted to know more about the tub armchair's history. He found a name, Lutie, on the original caster and asked Rebecca to do some research. She discovered that Lutie was a company in Birmingham known for high quality casters made in 1834. This showed the chair was from around 1840, making it a mix of late Regency and early Victorian styles. Even though they couldn't find the exact maker, the Lutie name added value and history to the chair, making it more attractive for their website. Drew and T dig for hidden gems at a Shropshire collector's dream. Drew and T visit Walcott Hall in Shropshire, home to collectors Robin and Lucinda Parrish. Drew spots a 19th century library chair in an outbuilding and asks if it's for sale. Lucinda hesitates, saying she's not sure about selling it. She likes the chair shape, but isn't sure if she wants to let it go. Drew thinks it's valuable and wonders if it's worth fixing up. While Lucinda thinks about the chair, Drew finds a large rusty meat hanging rack. This old French rack might be worth about £150 if restored. This early 20th century wall-mounted French meat rack would have been found in a butcher's or used by the cook of a large country house. It could be worth around £150 once restored. Lucinda is unsure if it's for sale, but suggests £75. Drew considers it and decides it could be a good buy. Drew also finds a cast iron fishing sign from the early 20th century. After a basic polish, it can be sold for £40. He negotiates a price of £20 for it. He hopes to buy the sign and the chair, offering a total of £250 for both. Lucinda agrees to the deal. Drew feels good about the finds, even though he's not sure if he'll be able to make a profit. Lucinda is pleased with Drew's visit and his knowledge about the items. She wishes Robin could have met him too. Drew and T visited the quiet Norfolk village of Carlton Road to meet Annabelle Anderson. She lived in the old rectory with her husband, Ian, and their two children, and various pets. As their children grew up and Ian began working in London... When we bought the house and moved here, we imagined it was going to be our forever home. Drew and T arrived at the old rectory and admired its Georgian charm. Annabelle, admitting she wasn't great at negotiating, welcomed them. Drew was impressed by the quality items and spotted a pair of 19th century Amari vases. Annabelle offered them for £500 and Drew agreed. Sealing his first deal, the house was filled with exquisite country house furniture, providing Drew with a great opportunity. 
he bought several items, including a Georgian bookcase for £1,200, a wild animal rug for £600, and a George II mahogany wall mirror for £120. He also purchased a mid-19th century burr walnut veneer cabinet for £1,300. Drew was thrilled with his purchases, especially the Amari table lamps and the cabinet. He valued their quality and condition, saying this was why he loved his job. Annabelle was pleased with the finds. She felt Drew had been generous. They ended the visit happy with their deals and the high quality of antiques they bought. Drew's foundry visits revealed rare treasures and the rich legacy of traditional ironworks. Drew's exploration of historic foundries uncovered captivating sites. These foundries are known for their intense heat, dramatic atmosphere, and distinct smells. These foundries churned out cast iron by the millions of tons that went all the way around the world. Notable examples include enduring bridges in Austria and India. Drew explored the John Taylor Bell Foundry in Lothborough. The foundry is celebrated for its 200-year tradition and distinctive bell casting technique. As the largest bell foundry globally, it has maintained its unique English method. This tradition has been in place since 1784. Drew found a pair of rare 19th century bells from North Yorkshire. Sold as a pair, they could have been worth around £1,000. He bought them for £600. Drew also visited Ballantyre's Casting near Edinburgh, established in 1856. It contained the company's 160-year-old archive of moulds used to make castings. Among them was a remarkable 19th century wooden mould with a memento mori design. This architectural element, meant as a somber reminder of mortality, was an exceptional find. Initially priced at £500, Drew negotiated and secured it, saying, That would be me done. And I'd say you've got a deal at 350 Thank you very Thank much. You. The mould was later used to create a new casting, highlighting its intricate craftsmanship and historical significance. Drew's foundry visits revealed rare items and highlighted the lasting legacy of traditional ironworks. Drew and Paul set out to transform a classic Triumph TR4, inspired by Giovanni Michelodi's timeless designs. Drew and Paul are on a journey to meet Mark O'Malley. O'Malley is a dealer who's turned his passion for Triumph TR cars into a successful business. He appreciates these cars because they're simple, easy to work on, and have relatively inexpensive parts. O'Malley is selling one of his TR4s because he's completed a few minor repairs and feels it's time to pass it on. Upon arrival, O'Malley shows them his collection of Triumphs. Among them, they focus on one particular car under a cover. When they reveal it, they find it equipped with chrome wire wheels, an aesthetic choice that is a matter of taste. Despite some imperfections, like misaligned number plates and a loose trim, the TR4's beauty and design stand out. Its timeless appeal is unmistakable. Even Drew, though, can't deny the TR4's star quality. The car's design, created by Giovanni Michelotti, established Triumph as an international sports car maker. Inspired by Michelotti's original concepts, Drew designs to add a design element from the Zoom prototype to their TR4. He enlists Charlie Seward, a skilled custom workshop owner, to fabricate the side gills from Michelotti's original design. Charlie Seward doesn't look like the average classic car restorer. Charlie creates the gills, ensuring that they fit seamlessly and enhance the car's look. After the work is completed, Drew and Paul admire the finished TR4 in scenic Port Merion. The car, now featuring Michelotti-inspired elements, looks stunning. They are delighted with how the new features complement its original elegance. Lamps not only illuminate the darkness, but also warm our hearts with their gentle glow. Dominic welcomed Drew and T warmly. They talked about the pub's decor and admired a pub ball. Get it down if you want to have a closer look. Dominic showed them his workshop explaining that he fixes and restores many things. Drew noticed an old item, and they discussed selling it. Dominic agreed to sell a lamp for £120. They also discussed another lamp from a nautical engineering company, agreeing on £100. Drew thought the lamps would sell quickly after cleaning. Next, they looked at a nine-arm chandelier. Though not very old, it looked nice. It's quite a decent size one, I particularly like the colour of that one. Dominic and Drew settled on £150 for it. They then explored a storage barn, Dominic showed them old penny machines and Russian diving boots. The boots, made of strong materials, were very interesting. They weighed almost 23 kilos and were collectible. Um, and I wouldn't mind getting that down. I can't really tell how old it is from where it, from where it is. Dominic and Drew agreed on £220 for them. Both were happy with the day's deals. Chairs not only offer a place to sit, but also enrich our lives with both style and comfort. The antiques trade keeps changing, 
and Drew has stayed successful for 30 years by adapting and staying ahead of competitors. He always looks for new contracts and likes meeting new dealers instead of the same ones. So anything new and different is always um, fun to see. This way, he gets new items and different ideas about the business. Drew and his colleague T go to Leeds, the UK's third largest city, to visit Ralph and Richard. These dealers have had an antique shop in Leeds for over 40 years. Leeds used to be a small town, but grew during the Industrial Revolution. Who knows what we're going to find. Somebody's been in the business that long. They must have a decent knowledge. Now it's a busy place with music, arts and culture. Ralph and Richard's shop, Retro Boutique, is full of mid-20th century furniture and quirky objects. Drew likes the shop's crowded layout because it means more chances to find good stuff. He finds an old chapel chair, but wishes that there were more. He buys it for £20. City, city centre shops are generally quite good. Drew also finds an ever-taught factory stall from the 1940s, which he gets for £60. Lastly, he buys some ceramic glove moulds for £550, hoping to make a profit. Meeting new dealers helps Drew expand his network and find new items. The visit ends well, with Ralph and Richard feeling a connection with Drew and T. Scissors not only cut paper, but also symbolize unity and precision, cutting through hatred among people. Drew's last stop in Yorkshire is an hour's drive south to the outskirts of Sheffield, where he visits a historic scissor manufacturer, William Whitley. This company, the oldest scissor maker in Sheffield, has been around since 1760 and is still owned by the same family for 11 generations. There's a lot of misunderstanding. People think Sheffield doesn't make anything anymore. Originally based in Sheffield's Cutler district, they now operate from a new factory in Holbrook. They make 250 different scissor designs for various materials, from bulletproof Kevlar to fine cloth. Sally Ward, part of the 11th generation, wants to show that Sheffield still makes quality products. Drew, the first antiques dealer to visit, gets a warm welcome and a factory tour. Oldest scissor makers in the Western world. I know. He watches as rough scissors are transformed into polished ones through a traditional process. Drew buys an old factory trolley for £180, planning to clean it up and sell it for around £350. He also buys two 1970s alloy mold presses for £200, thinking that they'd look great in a shop window. Sally shows Drew some historical items, including scissors from the 1851 Great Exhibition and medals from Parisin in 1855. Drew is fascinated by a pair of shears from 1900, listed in an old catalogue for £1.50. He buys them for £75, appreciating the connection to the Whitley family. This visit highlights William Whitley's long history and ongoing craftsmanship. Drew is impressed by their dedication and the quality of their work. The trip to William Wheatley is a unique and memorable experience for him. Drew uncovers treasures at the historic Gainsborough Silk. The show revisits Drew's top industrial finds and love for British manufacturing. Drew and T visit Sudbury, Suffolk, known for silk weaving. At Gainsborough Silk, co-owner Neil Thomas shows them around. Established in 1903, Gainsborough Silk supplies fabric for Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, the Sussex Wedding Carriage, St. Paul's Cathedral, Downton Abbey, and the Titanic. Neil takes them to the showroom, which has fabrics dating back to 1903. Customers often come back to find old house curtains made by Gainsborough, amazed by the records. Drew loves the factory floor, filled with vibrant colours and the buzz of old machinery. It's wonderful. Not all these beautiful colours everywhere. Love these places. You know, I love old factories. I like being around it. I like the smell. And I like the buzz. What a great place. In the fabric store, Drew learns that leftover fabrics are kept for sale. One special piece is a fabric woven to 1 12th scale for Queen Mary's dollhouse, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens. This unique fabric, made from organza silk, could be worth around £150 per metre. This fabric, used in some of the miniature rooms, was made here out of organzine silk, twisted from single filament threads rather than spun. It could be worth around £150 per metre. Drew negotiates and buys 5 metres for £85 per metre. Thrilled with the find, he also buys other fabrics for his warehouse, perfect for reupholstering furniture. Drew is thrilled with the valuable finds. He looks forward to returning to Gainsborough Silk, calling it a fantastic resource. The rare and exquisite fabrics will enhance the restoration and resale of his furniture, making the trip worthwhile. Drew's finds delight, turning history to profit overnight.
Antique expert Drew Pritchard visits a century-old family firm in Grimsby. He finds a decorative poster celebrating Britain's engineering past and buys it for £50. These posters are popular. He recently sold two for a kitchen. Drew then sees a well-made model of a tugboat called Samantha. He learns it's worth around £450 and negotiates to buy it for £250. He hopes to sell it for £350 to £400. In the boardroom, filled with the firm's history, Drew finds pictures of Edwin Bacon, the founder, who had 900 employees in Grimsby. He spots a brass date calendar from the 1950s or 60s worth about £50. Made from brass, it probably dates from the 1950s or 60s and could be worth around £50. And buys it for a tenner. Drew also notices a brass door sign from the Grimsby Meat Syndicate worth around £100 and buys it for £50. He's amazed by the history of the company and enjoys learning about its past. Drew is pleased with his unique purchases. The items will add value to his shop and attract customers. Drew enjoys the visit, appreciating the firm's history and unique pieces. He looks forward to reselling these finds, confident they'll be loved. Drew concludes it was a successful day, thrilled with the rare items he found. He can't wait to explore more places like this in the future. Discovering hidden gems, Drew Pritchard's day is filled with fascinating finds. Drew Pritchard walks into a shop and is immediately struck by a bike called Victor, which epitomizes his love for old items. This bike, dating back to 1869, is English and represents the very beginning of cycling. There you go, that's the beginning of cycling. That's the birth of cycling right there. So what age is that? 1869, English. Wow. It was known as a bone shaker due to its uncomfortable ride. As Drew explores, he finds a real bone shaker from the 19th century, a rare piece worth around £5,000. Today, a bone shaker could sell for around £5,000. The bike has minor, non-original parts, but its history and design are captivating. Drew's enthusiasm grows as he discovers a fire engine search lamp, a unique item needing restoration, but with potential value. He negotiates for the lamp, initially priced at £400, and manages to buy it for £225. Moving on. Drew spots a girl's bicycle from 1940, made by the Columbia Bike Factory in Massachusetts, featuring original grips, pedals, and a foul fuel tank. This bike, with its Buck Rogers-esque lamp, is worth around £600. This deluxe model has a lot of desirable extras. It could be worth around £600. Drew negotiates and buys it for £290. Next, a rare FD 150cc pickup truck catches his eye, valued between £8,000 and £9,000. For this one, for instance, would cost between eight and nine grand. Finally, Drew finds a 1956 Lambretta Series 2LD scooter, mostly original and valued at £2,500. He negotiates and buys it for £1,850, appreciating its shape and originality. Drew enjoys discovering these unique items, each with its own story, and looks forward to reselling them, confident they'll be cherished in their new homes. In Norfolk's charm, antiques galore, Drew and T explore and score. Drew and T head into the quiet village of Carlton Road in Norfolk, a half hour from Norwich. They meet Annabelle Anderson, who has lived at the old rectory for around five years. She lives there with her financial investor husband, Ian, their two children, and numerous pets. Initially envisioned as their forever home, Changes in life and Ian's job in London prompted the family to downsize. Annabelle and Ian are now selling their fine antiques. Upon arrival, Drew is struck by the house's quality. Beautiful. What a lovely space. He admires the Amari pots, confirming that they are originals and worth around £1,200. They agree on £500 for the pair. It's something in the region of £500 for the pair. I think that's very fair. Okay, good. Yeah. There you are. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Drew also spots an original Georgian bookcase and negotiates it down to twelve hundred pounds. Twelve hundred. How far apart are we? We're not very far apart at all. We can have a deal. Yeah. Deal. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> As they continue, Drew buys a unique rug for six hundred pounds and a George II mahogany wall mirror for one hundred and twenty pounds. Drew is delighted by the volume and quality of the country house items. In the ensuite, Drew finds a small pretty cabinet dating to the mid-19th century. Annabelle is willing to sell it for £1,300 
and Drew anticipates it fetching £1,800. He appreciates its beauty and is thrilled to acquire it. Drew relishes these moments, knowing such opportunities are rare. Drew Pritchard hunts for hidden gems and quirky finds at Scenery Salvage. Antique specialist Drew Pritchard is at Scenery Salvage, a business in Buckinghamshire that recycles sets from stage and screens. He recognizes the place and spots original 19th century Italian altar candlesticks that have been covered in paint and wrecked. Tim Williams offers Drew a massive chandelier made of glass bubbles, but at £250, Drew finds it too expensive and decides to pass. I'll be looking for about £250 for it. Um, I'm going to have to think about that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm just not sure about it. I can see the work. Yeah. I like it, and it's lit. It looks lit fantastic. Stunning. Tim presents some small hexagonal opaline glass lampshades from the 1960s. Drew is impressed by their quality and buys them for £5 each. They're perfect for small domestic settings like hallways or bathrooms, once restored and wired. The exploration turns playful as Drew and his team discover fun and quirky items. They come across a life-size figure of Elvis Presley from his Las Vegas years, spray-painted gold. Despite its questionable taste, Drew can't resist and buys it for £70. This humorous moment highlights the joy of finding unexpected treasures. Drew reflects on the day's finds, valuing both the items and the connections made. He enjoys meeting people and discovering new sources of antiques. This makes the job worthwhile, even when the finds are unconventional. The day ends with Drew donating the Golden Elvis to a charity auction, much to his team's relief. Sofas are art and an integral part of the house, offering comfort and style. The crew's skilled upholsterer takes on a big challenge, fixing what is said to be the worst Chesterfield sofa in the world. The sofa is about 100 years old and is full of dirt and woodworm damage. The dirt that's coming out of this is going to be 100 years old, at least. Despite its terrible condition, the sofa goes through a careful process to bring it back to life. The first step is removing the old, dirty fabric. As much of the original materials as possible is saved. Parts like springs and horsehair are cleaned and reused. The broken frame is fixed with new wood. There's no way I could even consider even trying to use anything like that. After many hours of hard work, the sofa starts to look good again. New fabric is added, showing off the classic Chesterfield diamond pattern. This project shows the crew's dedication and skill. They turned a ruined sofa into a beautiful green velvet Chesterfield. Now, it's worth over a grand. The sofa keeps its original charm while becoming strong and stylish again. I'm just going to add a bit of... Uh washing up liquid to them. The transformation highlights the expertise of the crew. They can revive even the most hopeless pieces of furniture. The end result is a stunning, valuable piece that looks nothing like the wreck it once was. Bingley Dell provides a picturesque retreat and embodies rural charm and tranquility. Drew and T travel 200 miles southeast to Tetbury in the Cotswolds to visit Alan Frost, a dealer who runs his garden antiques business entirely off-grid, relying on word of mouth. Alan's Abbey Nursery near Tetbury is filled with garden ornaments and architectural salvage. Alan does it very much doing his own thing and he is off-grid. Alan has lived there for about 20 years, starting with a tree nursery, then free-range hens, and finally focusing on garden ornaments and terracotta items. He enjoys making terracotta pieces and living in nature. Drew and T were greeted by Alan and found the yard to be unexpectedly grand and timeless. Alan showed them various items, including a terracotta piece prized at £1,200. They also saw a Christopher Dresser jardinier with twin fan handles and geometric banding. Despite some damage, Alan offered it at a reduced price of £695 and Drew bought it for £600, though he disliked the pedestal. They continued exploring and found a French terracotta pot valued at £400. Drew negotiated the pot's price down to £270. Alan's skill in making and repairing terracotta pieces was evident, often making it hard to tell his work from real antiques. His passion for creating and being surrounded by beautiful items was clear. Timeless quality about them, which have I just like, like yes. Yeah. Drew and T were impressed by the artistry and history in Alan's yard. The visit highlighted the charm and value of Alan's off-grid garden antiques business. Cars are not only for roads, but also capturing moments in time and telling stories. 
The boys are going to meet Wayne Rydell, who has a unique collection of cars for movies and TV shows. Most people think that they need to be immaculate and it's far from it, so we spend more time. Wayne has been doing this for over 35 years, making sure the cars match the time period of the film. They spend more time making the cars look old and dirty than clean. Wayne welcomes them, and they see many forgotten cars. A rare Renault 19 Chimard stands out. Wayne has about 150 cars now, down from 250. He explains how his cars create a sense of history. They find a Volkswagen Golf MK1, which excites them. The Golf MK1 was designed by Giorgetto Gugaro and came out in 1974. The GTI version, released in 1976, started the hot hatch trend. Paul checks the car for rust and finds it in good shape. Drew spots some modifications he doesn't like. The faded seats are a problem since the original material isn't made anymore. Restoring the car could be expensive. They discuss making the car look original again. After a test drive, they find it needs servicing, especially the exhaust. I can't quite put my finger on, on what on earth is going on here. They decide to buy the car for £6,000 and plan to restore it to its original condition. A battered Barcelona chair is meticulously restored into a stunning masterpiece. A man admires a Barcelona chair, noting its deteriorated state. Covered in pigeon droppings after 20 years in a dealer's warehouse, the dealer had intended to restore it but never did, allowing it to deteriorate further. The Barcelona chair, designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe for the 1929 International Exposition, epitomizes his less is more philosophy. This 1960s model, produced by Knoll, is severely damaged with beyond repair leather and snap straps. The man bought it for £250, drawn by its potential, despite the extensive restoration needed. The restoration involves multiple experts. Stripping down the chair reveals a poor prior restoration using rubber Pirelli webbing, instead of original leather straps. The restorer carefully removes the webbing and chipboard, exposing the rivet holes for the original straps. Precision sewing reconstructs the leather cushions. High-quality materials ensure they match the original design. This includes making piping for strength, sewing a grid-like structure, and aligning buttons to maintain the chair's geometric shape. A factory-fresh Barcelona chair will cost you £6,000. And a well-restored vintage example can command a high price. The completed restoration reveals a dramatically improved chair, with a polished metal frame and meticulously crafted leather cushions. Attention to detail ensures the chair's authenticity and value, transforming a dilapidated piece into a designer masterpiece. Chelmsford, Essex's sole city, received its designation from the Queen in 2012 as part of her Diamond Jubilee celebrations. A short drive away, a vast area of land is interspersed with various structures, including homes, sheds, and pigsties. This is where John Giles operates his engineering business. John's property includes buildings originally sourced from Roxwell, Kent, which were repurposed to accommodate people displaced by wartime bombings in London. After acquiring these structures in the early 1980s, John has used them for his diverse engineering work. As he nears retirement, John is now focused on clearing out these storied sheds that have accumulated a significant amount of items over the years. Yeah, I just love these sheds. <laughs> I love gold sheds like this. The task of sorting through these cluttered buildings falls to Drew, who despite the challenging conditions and unusual spaces like pigsties, is determined to explore every corner. One notable find is an old multi-purpose theatrical lighting setup that includes a Pattern 23 spotlight made by Strand Electric and a floodlight by Mole Richardson. These lamps, dating from the early 1960s, feature Frenzel lenses, which were instrumental in the development of film lighting. They are estimated to be worth around £600 in another location. Seaton, a coastal town on the Jurassic coast of Gavan, Drew encounters antique floodlights. These floodlights, believed to be from around 1950 and originally thought to be World War II searchlights, were actually manufactured by Siemens Brothers in London. These rare designs and quality of these floodlights make them very valuable. Despite the change in provenance, this design is very rare and they could be worth around £1,500. Despite initial pricing challenges, Drew successfully negotiates for these unique items. I have been into the corners of barns and sheds and lofts and, uh, you know, that was one of the hardest to get into. It was so tricky getting in there, but it's worth Old Gothic antique shops exude charm, drawing in enthusiasts and collectors alike with its unique treasures. Among them, 
Drew Pritchard, a seasoned expert in antiques, meticulously examines each item with a discerning eye. One standout is the early 17th century staircase. Its craftsmanship speaks volumes of its historical significance and architectural beauty. Drew's admiration extends to a Coromandel wood trinket box from the 1830s, notable for its rarity and exquisite detailing, reflecting Sri Lanka's rich craftsmanship. Valued at approximately £250, its scarcity contributes to its high desirability among collectors. Moreover, Drew purchased a bedside pot for £200, intending to sell it after some minor restoration for around £325. His exploration continued at an antique warehouse in Eversham, where he discovered a unique item, a gothic linen cupboard that caught Drew's attention for its simplicity and elegance, reminiscent of Augustus Pugin's influential style revival in the 19th century. Originally from a church, its classic lines make it an ideal addition to any home, valued at approximately £700. Moving on to the English, Welsh and Scottish railway first aid cabinets, Drew found these pieces intriguing for their historical significance and quirky details. Originating from locations like Bristol, these cabinets feature original hand-painted finishes and interior compartments, retaining elements from their use during periods like the Second World War. Great original paint, quirky inside, fun, but pretty original. It's had a couple of bits of repainting. Despite some repainting over time, they remain authentic and charming, potentially fetching around £600 each. During negotiations, Drew secured one cabinet for £350, with an additional £10 for the key, highlighting his keen eye for value and quality. Another similar cabinet, purchased for £360, was discussed for a potential retail display, after having previously sold a comparable piece for £550. Throughout his journey, Drew's restoration expertise shines, from meticulously cleaning mahogany pieces to preserve marble tops and enhance their allure with careful staining and waxing. Tables not only serve as functional furniture, but also hold stories and history. Amanda and Jack Stevenson run a business called Sawmill Architectural Antiques, celebrating their first year. They are new dealers learning the ropes in Macclesfield, an area known for its old mills and factories. They saw a chance to make money from these buildings by dealing in industrial salvage. Great industrial building suits perfectly what they're selling. Their shop is well organized and fits perfectly with their industrial theme. They upcycle and make unique pieces using reclaimed wood. Drew visits their shop and is impressed by their collection. He finds a 1950s school table by Practical Equipment Limited, but one table is missing trim. Drew shares advice on avoiding common mistakes, like buying too much unsellable stuff. He spots an old cast iron work table from the 1800s and a tobacco cutting machine. The machete's value depends on its story. This could be worth around £225. Drew buys the work table and machete for £525. Jack is happy, but knows he needs to verify the machete's story. Drew reflects on how similar Jack's journey is to his own early days. He encourages Jack to stay put and focus on quality items. Amanda and Jack appreciate Drew's advice and are excited about their future. They realize the importance of good stories in their business. It's a valuable reminder that the key to good antique dealing is being able to walk away. Drew is pleased with his finds and looks forward to visiting again. The visit highlights the challenges and rewards of the antique business. The guest's keen eye immediately lands on a pair of modernist armchairs upon arriving. These late 1970s chairs boast a distinctive Scandinavian design, featuring comfortable rattan seating and beautiful splat work details that add a touch of visual intrigue. Despite some minor damage to the rattan, the tactility of the material and the overall design is visually appealing. The arm rail with that lovely point, and then the widened and flattened armrests are just incredibly classy and stylish. This pair of caned walnut lounge chairs are typical of high-end Danish designers of the time. At an auction, after restoration, it could be worth 1,200 pounds. Negotiation commences, but after some back and forth discussion, they reach a final price of 400 quid. Yeah, yeah, final level. Deal, mate. Well, Deal. Thank you. From hidden treasures to Canon Grand, Drew's eye for antiques is truly in demand. Drew travels over 300 miles to Ghent to visit a house owned by the Dawes family for generations. The estate, Mount Ephraim, 
is three miles east of Faversham and has been in the Dawes family since the 17th century. Built by Sir Edwin Dawes in 1878, the house is now managed by his great-great-great-grandson, William. Inside, the house mixes different styles with the cast iron Rococo swirls. Neoclassical columns and Georgian plasterwork showcase the family's wealth and travels. Drew explores the house and finds a 19th century chinoiserie car table worth £500. Although it has some water damage, it still has its original paintwork. Chinoiserie is a European style inspired by Eastern design, popular in the 18th century. Drew then goes to the basement, where he's excited to find a pair of ornamental cannons. Oh, great. You got a pair of them? Definitely two. There might be three. Really? Yeah, you just made my day. These 18th century cast iron cannons are mounted on oak carriages from the 19th or early 20th century and were used for display and have a potential value. Once restored, however, they could be worth around £3,000. Even though the cannons are weathered, Drew is excited about them. He offers William £1,000 for the pair and £500 for a single cannon, making a total of £1,500. William accepts the offer and the cannons are sent to Gav for restoration. Gav treats the bases with wood hardener to strengthen and protect the oak. Once restored, the cannons are photographed and prepared for sale. Drew is happy with the restoration, noting it was more of a conservation job and praising the team's work. Particularly pleased with how the restorations come out. It's more of a conservation job than restoration, and the lads have got it spot on. 